market wants or needs this product or not. Um, and whether or not the market size and characteristics um, will support the cost on the effort to develop a given product. Are there any unmet clinical needs? Um, how will we validate the product as we move along? Um, and particularly, how will we um, validate the concept of the product before we, before we get started? How will we determine customer preferences and clinical applications for the proposed product? Um, how will we determine the usage environment? And all these things will lead to the product specification. Um, and we always want to remember that we use market research to keep us always market driven versus product driven. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we move along as well. Contribution to the product development process of market research is very significant. Um, it avoids resource allocation to products that the market doesn't want and it doesn't need. It integrates customer preferences into the product concept. We can get information from the outset on our what we think is a pretty good idea and determine if the customer, the marketplace, equally thinks it's a good idea. Um, in the process, we can integrate clinical needs into the product design, uh, largely based on the usage um, and we can use these factors as well to uh, validate the design. And it even helps us guide the cost of goods and pricing determinations, which we'll talk a little bit more about later as well. Um, and we're going to have a brief summary and takeaways, the key elements that I think um, are worthwhile to keep in mind. Activity. Definition of market research. I think market research is a systematic, objective analysis and dissemination of information. And by doing these four things with the information, you facilitate decisions and actions that lead to successful performance in the marketplace. It's a rigorous process. It's, in many ways, just like science. Um, we have to define the problem. We have to design the instruments to examine the problem. We need to collect the data scientifically and particularly we need to document it, and we need to interpret the data so that we can take action um, and leverage on our market research investment. If we don't get the, once we get the information, if we don't disseminate it and turn it into action, we wasted a lot of resources. Methods for market research. There's basically primary research and secondary research. Um, the strange thing, perhaps. Uh, you might think is that secondary market research usually comes first because secondary market research uses existing sources. Uh, and amongst those existing sources are web search engines. Everybody Googles everything today. That's a good place to start. Um, there are published reports. There are um, market research organizations that all they do is market research and publish reports that are available often at a significant price, but if the, uh, uh, the topic is uh, pretty much exactly what you're looking for. That investment may be well worthwhile. The downside of these reports is that they're not always terribly accurate because um, the sources of the information are often industry sources, and industry sources may or may not be entirely <coughs> accurate with regard to what they tell uh, the researcher. Peer-reviewed journal articles are an excellent source of information. Um, government statistics, possibly the best source of information generally pretty accurate, but often dated and will be several years behind um, the published reports. Uh, public company annual reports are a marvelous resource uh, of information. The problem there can be is that oftentimes the information you're looking for, there are few of any uh, publicly held companies in that space. And so you have to look at uh, uh, private companies where the information is far less. Mm -hmm. Private company press releases can be very useful. Private companies are often interested in keeping the community, keeping the investment community aware of what they're doing, and those press releases can be useful. Uh, investment related newsletters, there's quite a few of them out there, some by subscription, some are free. Uh, I highly recommend those, particularly for um, products that are um, particularly innovative and are likely to be developed in an entrepreneurial environment. Uh, and of course, professional associations, both industry professional associations and physician based. 
Chemistry Association's often has a great deal of very useful information. <coughs> um, another method, a key method, is the primary market research. And this, of course, comes from new sources. Those sources may be industry experts. Um, they need to always be, in part, key opinion leaders. These are physicians who have a very high profile in the medical community. Uh, often they are uh, very well published, very well respected, and will often hold a, um, a position in their respective professional societies. Again, the voice of the customer appears. Um, and this is the single most important element of primary research. I can't emphasize enough the importance of talking to the customer, not just at the beginning of the project, but throughout the project and after the project is over to see, uh, to do the follow-up. Um, and the voice of the customer in a way will be an existing customer base. It may be potentially new customers for an existing product. You want to expand into new markets and new applications for what may be a uh, platform technology. Um, or target market for a brand new product, uh, something that you haven't done before. Perhaps there's nothing like it in that space. There's qualitative and quantitative market research. Uh, and you usually start with the subjective or the qualitative um, market research. Um, and these uh, take a number of different forms. Um, the in-depth interview um, is uh, often where we start. Uh, it can be face-to-face -face or the telephone. I personally prefer the face-to-face -face where we can actually see the body language and we can see the face of the individual we're, we're speaking to. But in the absence of that, in terms of speed and cost, the telephone interview is different. Better in that respect. Um, it's, these are market uh, these uh, qualitative methods, particularly the in depth interviews, are really good for market segmentation criteria, things like who is doing what to whom and why. And you can do a really deep dive into that with the people that you're interviewing. These interviews may be as much as 45 minutes to an hour. Um, but when you're through and you do a, a few of them, uh, and the responses are pretty much the same from, for all the uh, respondents that you were talking to. You've got a, a pretty good handle on, on, on the issue. Um, you talk about unmet clinical needs. You can talk about expectations of a possible product uh, to meet those unmet clinical needs. And you can learn a lot about the purchasing drivers and the process of purchasing. These elements are key. Is, no matter how good the product is, no matter how good, uh, how, how well it meets unmet uh, marketing, uh, unmet clinical needs. Um, if you don't understand who purchases and why and how, um, you will have some difficulty during the marketing phase of the product, introduction of the product. Um, another uh, subjective and qualitative method is observational field work, um, where you're looking at the environment the product is going to be in. You're going to look at the behavior of the people who use the product. Um, and, and how exactly how it is used. And again, I can't emphasize enough that if you can get out there and spend time in the place where the proposed product is going to be used, it, is, it, it just offers a wealth of information that cannot be gathered any other way. Um, another uh, research method that is uh, subjective is the focus group. I'm sure you've all heard about focus groups. And love them, some people hate them, um, but they are a necessary part of this uh, process. Usually it's about eight people, eight participants. Um, there will be a moderator um, who has put together a discussion guide uh, to guide the um, meeting, the, the group. They usually take up to 90 minutes, usually not long, <coughs> so they begin to fade. Um, and we always record it for later review, usually audio and video recording both. Oftentimes, the client will be there behind the big mirror, two, big one-way mirror, two-way mirror, um, and so, so they themselves can see the responses of the individuals in the presentation. Um, it's very, very good for product concept testing. You can take prototype products, take drawings, take whatever you've got, and see how these people react. And of course, you're getting complete recording. Um, I recommend the focus groups be done not just in one part of the country, but if possible, to be done in several different parts of the country because uh, physician perceptions, nurses' perceptions, and training are significantly different uh, throughout the U.S. 
very good to gain consensus feedback. You have six different focus groups, and the consensus is pretty much the same from all of them. Uh, you probably take it to the bank. And you'll see group dynamics, and, and you have to kind of be careful. It's a double-edged sword. Group dynamics, um, uh, you got to watch out for them because you can have one, one or two people lead the entire group possibly in a direction where they not all necessarily want to go. But it also can provide you with people who may well be referral centers for you down the road, people who clearly are leaders and clearly are people that you'd like to have involved in your product uh, uh, as you develop it and possibly uh, during the marketing introduction. Caveat here for the focus group is that you need interviews in order to prepare the discussion side. Discussion guide. You can't really have a good focus group if you don't have your interviews first. You know what questions to ask, what ones you want to explore in more depth. Um, then we also have quantitative market research. Uh, this is objective, and because it's objective, we're going to have closed format questions, um, questions yes or no, or uh, multiple choice. Um, and it's in a form that where we can do some statistical validation after the fact. Uh, these things are really good for customer perception and satisfaction. Um, you can do conjoint analysis where the, um, the respondent is asked to choose between various elements. Um, what do they prefer between these two things? What, are they, what uh, uh, company do they prefer among several companies? Which would they pay more for? These kinds of questions can give us some serious quantification um, related to related to uh, um, product development. Uh, we can do competitive comparisons uh, with uh, uh, quantitative uh, analysis, and uh, we can ask the customer, kind of force the potential customer into making decisions about the e economic value of features. Talk a little bit more of that later, but this is really, really important. Again, the caveat is that you need the qualitative research first so that you can develop the appropriate question. Okay, we when we do market research, one of the first things we're doing it for is so that we can determine the market size and characteristics. If we're in an entrepreneurial mode, in order for us to seek funding, we have to have chapter and verse on the, on the market size and the characteristics. You need to do a serious deep dive into exactly what that market is all about. Again, who does what to whom and why. Uh, and put numbers on it as best we can. What is the total available market? What is the market that's addressable by uh, anyone or possibly just us, depending on what we're looking at? And how do we, what is the target market? And how do we get to that target market? How do we reach it? Um, what is the annual revenue of this particular potential market? both um, in the U.S. and global. Does the market exist now, or are we, are we extrapolating? Uh, what's the protected, protected growth rate of this particular market? Is it growing at double digits, or is it hardly growing at all? Or is it shrinking? Target market segmentation. Again, clinical applications. What medical specialties are involved in this market? What are the patient demographics in this market? Um, is it baby boomers who are, who are getting older by the day? Um, is it children? Um, these are fundamental issues that determine whether or not uh, it's a good idea to proceed on the road of product development. Um, and again, I can't emphasize enough the importance of things that we kind of tend to forget when we get involved with product development, product design, and the clinical aspects. We must keep in mind the economic, the reimbursement, and the patient preference aspects. Um, patient preference is, is, is increasingly important, especially knowledge of patients. Patients are not dummies anymore. They don't just um, do whatever the physician tells them. They don't go into a physician's um, appointment uh, without any information. Very frequently, frequently they have quite a lot of information. Um, and they do have preferences. And knowing what those are uh, in advance is very helpful. You can find out about current players. Um, what are their potential competitor strengths and weaknesses? And how can we address them? Should we Very key element is the unmet clinical needs. Um, so often, I find that clients think they have a fabulous idea and it fits in nicely with the existing product line. It fits in nicely with their strategic plan, but they may or may not have a really good handle on unmet clinical needs. 
And if you, if we don't have an element, it's not a guarantee. It's, it's a necessary but not sufficient element. But if we don't meet an unmet clinical need, our product is going to go nowhere. Um, so we can use market research to address this, verify consensus on a clinical research issue. You talk to a dozen physicians, and they all say, wow, do we wish we had a solution to this problem. That's really useful <coughs> information. If none of them say they, they, this is a problem, then that tells you something as well. Um, what is the standard of care? Let's say that there is a clinical issue. Um, what is the current standard of care around that, and what are the clinical, the current workarounds that physicians or nurses um, currently uh, use to get around the unmet clinical need, to address it as best they can? And how does that possibly contribute to your solution? Will intervention change clinical outcome? Very often you get the question, so what, by the, the interviewees. I have this fabulous idea, I can diagnose stuff and such uh, wirelessly and cheaply and quickly, but if the physician sees no value in that information, then it's probably not a good idea to proceed. If there is intervention that will change clinical outcome, and more and more today clinical outcome is fundamental, positive clinical outcome, cost effectiveness are key product acceptance. What's the potential cost of the solution related to the cost of current outcome? Who saves money? Who makes money? What is the what is the uh, um, cost of the current outcome and how would that cost be reduced with the outcome from uh, the product, perceived product? And it's important to interview everybody that has a stake in this concept, this product, this market. Physicians, both the key opinion leaders we mentioned earlier, but also those who look to them. Understand, key opinion leaders are really important in this process. We need to, we need to involve them. But in the final analysis, there's a very few of them. And if the product is going to be commercially successful, the product must address the needs of most of the buyers, the average physician, the average nurse, um, technologist in the hospital, whatever the target market may be. And of course, we need to talk to buyers, payers, and patients where appropriate. And I want to emphasize the payers. It's entirely possible that your product may have more of a market with the payers, with the insurance companies, who are seeking to save money at every turn, than the, your original idea for, for a physician or a hospital. In any event, you really want to know, uh, as part of the drivers that we mentioned before, you really want to know about what, what the payers, what their position is now, and what the payers think about this potential uh, product concept. You want to validate that product concept. We want to product validate the concept early. We want to validate it with all stakeholders through interviews and focus groups. We want to validate multiple concepts. You may have more than one idea to address an unmet clinical need. Um, you can, um, it's particularly you know, the product concept validation with the focus group a good place to do that. Um, does the concept meet the unmet clinical needs? Seems like, like a simple question. But it's uh, we often overlook um, in our rush to get the, get the concept to market. We often um, fail to understand how that concept will meet the need and make sure that it continues to meet the need as it goes through its various iterations in the design process. And in that process, you need to be flexible. There will be many times when you're going to have to change something. Some Software, some hardware, um, um, graphic user display, whatever, um, in order to meet uh, the needs of the potential users. Uh, and again, base, select the concept based on market input, not internal preferences, because it's easier or cheaper um, for the development team to do it. One way is not necessarily, in fact, probably is not the best way to do it. We've got to address it. Um, we've got to address the market input. Customer preferences. Um, we want to bring the, the product to the potential user early and often and confirm that what, we, what we're doing meets, continues to meet their needs. Um, and that's both for the physical characteristics and the user interface. You can use it for both new products uh, and improvements to existing products. Um, I found that there's um, a, a large range of potential users and it's some sites are better than others. Some are very well organized. Uh, some are very responsive. Some really understand what the product is and what you're trying to do. Others, less so. 
Um, so I think it's important to choose them wisely so you don't waste your own time. Um, and if possible, be there. It's primary and observational research. If you can get out there and talk to the customer, uh, see them using the product, see how they do things now, this is, uh, this is invaluable. Okay, clinical applications. For what clinical application will a proposed product be targeted? And again, a deep dive is really, really important here. We really need to understand exactly who is going to use this product for what purpose on whom and what is the expected outcome. How common is the clinical condition? If there's only six cases of this particular problem a year, it's probably not a market you want to pursue uh, with a new product. Um, and how does your product concept address multiple clinical conditions do you have platform technology, or is this just a one, one trick pony? If you want to try to avoid one trick ponies when we can, obviously, we'd rather have platform technology that we can develop into many products in many markets. Um, ultrasound is a good example of that. Um, research here relates to the clinical indication. This is the, now we're getting to the regulatory area, um, because clinical indications um, have a direct impact on how you position the product um, with the FDA and then what steps you take um, through the regulatory process uh, and the product family development. What, what products will you develop first in the product family, um, particularly if it relates to regulatory, to FDA. Um, again, this goes into you need to have a, a regulatory uh, strategy just as you need to have a marketing strategy. Um, and of course, in this, in, for this, for the clinical application, we use the primary and secondary research. Okay, um, again, understanding exactly how the product will be used, where, by whom, for what purposes. I think particularly with regard to the conditions. And it's conditions before, during, and after uses of the product, something we, we tend to forget. You know, is it going to be hot or cold throughout the, this, this, this product's uh, usage cycle or storage cycle? Is it going to be wet or dry? Is it going to be used in good light or lousy light? Um, it, is the physician or the nurse or whoever is the technician who's using the product, do they have easy access to the patient or poor access to the patient? Is it going to be used in a high noise or low noise environment? Is there going to be a lot of interference, uh, including electromagnetic? On. It's, it's always a key, key issue. Um, the operator room is a very hostile environment for uh, many products. It needs to be addressed. What, again, the before, and during, and after aspects. What are going to be the storage, the sterility, and the disposable conditions under which this proposed product is going to be used? And again, it's observational. So if possible, be there. If it's going to be used in the operating, go to the operating room. If it's going to be used in the ED, go to the ED. Market research is very useful in determining product specifications. It's an essential part of determining product specifications. You don't have to develop in a vacuum. You don't have to proceed with questions unanswered that you believe are relevant to the success of the product's um, features. Um, and again, the voice of the customer, um, they will tell you what they're looking for. And they'll often be delighted to have an opportunity to tell you what they want. And they will be delighted to provide feedback. Um, they'll take time out of their day with, 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 uh, um, very frequently to, to help you out uh, and to confirm that the product is going to meet their needs. They're delighted to be part of the process. If you provide solutions to their problems, they'll buy the product. <coughs> Years ago, we developed a, uh, a, uh, an automated product to make the life of the non-invasive vascular technologists easier. Their, product, their life up to that point had been a, a, a maze of, of buttons and tubes and uh, bladders and uh, transducers to try and get information on non-invasive vascular diagnostics uh, in a given patient, what's their arterial blood flow, the venous blood flow, and so on. Um, we saw their problems. We talked to them about their problems, and we developed an automated did everything for them. All they had to do was push a button to start it um, and push a button to finish it. 
Um, they could start and stop chart recorders. They could start and stop inflations if they wished. Uh, and of course, all the numbers came up on a display when it was over. They loved it, and we were the market leader for over 10 years. Uh, it's a particularly good example of how talking to the marketplace, understanding their needs, and providing something that meets those needs uh, makes a very successful long-term product and market leadership. Um, as we all know, features are not free. It's important to determine which ones are most important, which ones are worth the expense of developing and including in the product, um, and knowing with reasonable assurance that those are the right features and that they, they will meet unmet uh, clinical needs, they will meet what the uh, target market is looking for, and the product will be successful. And again, we're using qualitative and quantitative research, particularly interviews and surveys, and again, the conjoint analysis is very useful specifying and making and having a, potentially users choose between features. The first product doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to has to work reasonably well and meet the needs that we've talked about. The other features and improvements can be added later. And again, this process helps us to determine what those are. R and D budgets are never big enough. Does anyone here have a research budget that's bigger than they need? Probably not. Um, so we really uh, we want to use the resources that we have to the best uh, possible way. Um, and so it maximizes the efficient allocation of your resources, and in, in, in doing so, it maximizes the number of successful products in the marketplace because we provided products that the market wanted and met their needs. It also minimizes time to market because they don't waste a lot of time on stuff that the market didn't want in the first place. And we didn't have starts and stops um, with regard to uh, uh, features and, and uh, hardware and software stuff. It contributes to product uh, customer perception of the company product. Companies that are out there in front of the customer routinely, frequently, and asking their opinion, asking their participation, keeping them involved, are always perceived as market leaders. They're perceived positively uh, and as market leaders one of the leading ultrasound companies uh, in the country. I was talking to recently about doing some market research with their existing customers regarding service, the quality of the service. And it wasn't even service provided by the company, it was provided by subcontractors. But the company cared enough to, to, keep, to keep up on what their customers were thinking about and, and how their customers' needs were being met with service from subcontractors. That's a market leader. Obviously, um, it strengthens the return on investment in the company's financial condition. When you have lots of successful products in the marketplace and as quick a time as possible, you're going to improve that, uh, that ROI. And again, we get increased contributions to better patient care. Good as our products may be, as much as we may love to develop them, design them, release them, market them, at the end of the day, what gets me out of bed is when I know that I'm providing better patient care and my customers tell me and occasionally even see or meet a patient who's had their lives improved or saved because of what you did. That's, uh, that's important. Market research integrates clinical needs into the product design. It reduces the relation to previous slide and reduces the risk that the project, product will be rejected by the target market. I'm sure we've all heard about, uh, about uh, products that have been rejected. Coca-Cola incident with New Coke. It's a perfect example. Essentially, none or very little market research was totally rejected. Very expensive exercise for them. Um, it increases user satisfaction and, and the product company's credibility, just as we mentioned earlier. It facilitates the sales process. Sales guys have a heck of a lot easier time in selling a product, and the marketeers have a much easier time marketing the product. That Customers actually want to buy. We don't, we don't have to beat them over the head. We've got a product that they really want and would really like to buy. Not that it's always easy, but it's easier uh, when we do these things and uh, we, we, uh, we get the product right the first time. Um, and again, we, better, we contribute to better patient care because the product has been accepted. The product is being used and applied to patients um, in the way that we uh, had, uh, had designed it to be the way the, uh, the market wanted it to be. And we initiate a path to improve the standard of care. It 
may well take 5, 7, 10, 15 years, but in the long run, if the product really meets patients' needs and the target market's needs, physicians, nurses, whatever, you are going to be eventually contributing or may well become the standard of care. Usage environment in the product design. Um, you cannot understand how the product will be used if you don't talk to people and you don't go and see how they use it. And again, I highly recommend that you as the, the designers of these products, whenever you can, go out and see how it's used. You will always get more information. It will always mean more to you if you can do that rather than just accept specifications from the marketing guys, good as they may be. It's never as good as going out there yourself and, uh, and talking to customers and seeing how the product is used in the environment in which it will be used. Um, and focus on safety as well as performance criteria. It's something we don't necessarily think about all that much. It's something that the customer doesn't always think about all that much. But we have to design safety for the user and safety for the patient, obviously, uh, in our products. We have a marvelous source of design product validation in market research, in the customer. Uh, and it can be and should be implemented at multiple points during the validation process. Um, and documentation um, of this validation process is just, the point, just as important when you're working with um, uh, customers, potential customers, uh, as it is for our own internal documentation and regulatory uh, purposes. Um, and we need to address all aspects of design and understand that these, these things are really, really important to users. A product may well be rejected simply because its footprint's too big, um, or it's too heavy, or the display is wrong. Um, so we really need to address these relatively straightforward size, shape, weight, ergonomics, and even color uh, issues. And of course, of the software, the user interface, the graphics, touch control of the, of the, if we're using a screen or a, a membrane. Um, and what are the input-output requirements? Um, I'm sure you've all heard of WYSIWYG, for example. Uh, what you see is what you get. Um, if the printout, assuming there is printout, and many, many patients you still need a paper printout uh, during the product, um, the, the customer expects what comes out of that printer to look pretty much like what they saw on the screen. And if it doesn't, they're upset. Um, and it's misleading to them, and they don't like it, and in the end, they're fixing it. So if you get it right the first time, you save a lot of time and grief. Um, good market research helps to guide cost of goods and pricing determinations because you know what features need to be incorporated. Uh, and so you spend your money wisely on incorporating those features. If, and, in, and that goes directly to the cost of goods. For example, you've got a transcranial Doppler monitoring system. And it's, it's, being, it's being adapted from a single channel diagnostic transcranial Doppler system. Um, the question is, do we need it to be bilateral because it's not a monitor? Making it bilateral is a very significant cost increase in the cost of goods. Uh, two transducers, lots more electronics, lots more engineering time, on and on. Um, it would be really nice to know if that's necessary. It turns out it is. Um, and the product that we developed as a result was, again, a market leader. Um, will a customer pay more? If you get it right, they will pay more. And you'll price the product right in the first place because you know the value that the, that the potential customer places on it. You'll know that the selected features are consistent with the user's expectations. If you do it in a vacuum, you won't know that. And uh, it helps you to prioritize your features, the hardware and software, based on customer preferences and willingness to pay for them. Again, you're not going to put everything you can do, in fact, you're not even going to know everything that you need to put in a given product initially. But you will know what you need to put in the first one. And then over time, you will be able to prioritize. And over time, you will be able to put other features in down the road and uh, with your product family. So to summarize, market research can mean the difference between company stagnation or growth. It can mean the difference between product line stagnation or growth and the customer's perception thereof uh, of the product and of the company. Um, it helps to align the product with pricing and positioning. Positioning is 
fundamental. Good positioning, accurate positioning is fundamental to marketing and product and market acceptance. And if you've done your homework, you'll know exactly how to position that product. And you won't have to reposition and confuse the market down the road. And it can mean the difference between making the customer very upset or making the customer absolutely delighted because they were involved. And delighted customers is a lot easier to do and keep in the face of intense competition than one who is really upset. So good market research is fundamental. The cost of getting it wrong and fixing it later is far greater than getting it right the first time. I suspect many of you have had this experience. Um, you do not need to design or create products in a vacuum. The customer, the market, wants to talk to you. And they want to be involved. And they want to verify, just as you want to verify and validate your product. Keep them involved. And you yourself, get involved early, get involved often. OK. Um, we're happy to take whatever questions you may have at this point. Um, if you would like a copy of the, uh, of the slides, please feel welcome to contact me um, at my email address, and I'm happy to send them to you and answer questions offline. Do we have any questions? Sure. What's one of the biggest challenges developing a medical device versus some other the biggest challenges? In my experience, the biggest challenges are, the, are early in the process. And doing the market research necessary, starting with the in-depth secondary market research, and moving to appropriate primary market research to, to get the information you need to be as certain as possible that there really is an unmet clinical need, that there really is a market for this product. You can cite chapter and verse on who is going to do what to whom and what the outcome will be, because you've done your homework. Think of it as what you need to do to sell the content to an investor, even though that may not be your situation. I think that's probably the best common denominator to, to work with. That's the denominator I frequently work with. And if you can sell this concept to an investor who may be tentatively investing millions, um, sometimes of their own money, uh, you better be really sure and be able to have the information um, to be able to sell that investor. Um, because down the road, assuming you get the funding um, or your client company um, sees it through, sees the process all the way through, you're going to have to sell it. Somebody's going to have to buy it. And if you screwed up along the way, you're not going to sell it and they're not going to buy it. And you're going to have that problem we just had here, try and fix it after the fact. So again, I urge up front, lots of time um, spent up front, really understanding the need, really understanding the market, really understanding the potential, and who will use it, why, but the, how it will change the outcome, and of course what the cost are. Does that answer the question? Yeah. We talked a lot about uh, the research you do at the development side, but what after the product is in the field? Do you draw the same kind of uh, courses that you described? Yes, yes, and there's there's a number of reasons to do that. Um, once it's out in the field, we want first we want to be sure it's working properly, that it's that the warranty is what it should be, that it's, that it's being serviced when necessary properly, all that. But it also provides you with a lot of information about the next generation. This is great, but I really wish I had such and such. You may have already known that, but needs change, perceptions change, especially when the products are in use in the environment by hopefully hundreds, if not thousands, of users of your product. Uh, and you get invaluable information, again, solid information um, for the next uh, aspect of design and next generation. what your customer is willing to pay for your product? It's a really good question, and it's it's not an easy answer. There's a certain amount of, it, it's, it's less hard. Uh, the answer is less hard than I would like. Um, but again, the conjoint analysis will help. Um, obviously, the cost of good has to be uh, a part of, uh, of your product.
pricing, but it by no means should be all that you use. In, in the old days, you used to, you know, order, what's your cost of goods, and then you tack on your gross margin, and that's your price. Um, that doesn't work anymore. I'm sure you've all heard of value pricing, the term value pricing. And that's basically what will what will the market pay for? What is the value of the product to the target market? And that is determined by, by some of that uh, quantitative uh, market research that I mentioned, uh, particularly with conjoint analysis, where you can we can we can we can literally get a, a, a list of features, the most important features to the user, and therefore the features they will pay the most for. Okay, um, and in some cases we can even put dollars on that. We can even put dollars on that. Uh, we get a range. You know, product with thus and such features. Uh, meeting thus and such clinical need, um, would you be willing to pay between 100 bucks and 150 bucks, or 150,000 and 200,000? Um, but it's, again, it's it's not as hard and fast as I would like. Certainly not as hard and fast as some of the other aspects we're talking about here. But it would very definitely give you a guide. Very definitely give you a guide, and he also gives you, give you a very good guide to the cost of goods. Uh, the cost of goods are a key element. for your interest.